All right, so let's get started. Um, I think arguably we might be in a little bit of a better place in here than we were in steel design because in steel design we were sort of continuing a topic that we were, we were still doing before spring break. So it's like, wait, residual stresses, what? I'm working on it. Interrupting my flow here, Mr. Mukinick. Interrupting my flow, goodness. I'm just kidding. No, but in here I think we're in a little bit of a, a good, better spot because we're picking up a new topic, which is the topic of deflections. So here's this, so I'll go ahead and pass that out. I did. I don't know so much about now. What's that? Did I go Easter egg hunting? No, no, I didn't go Easter egg hunting. <laughs> A random statement, but okay. Um, so, what we're going to talk about now is deflection considerations. Um, a couple things about this topic. Deflection considerations are primarily what we call a service limit state. Now what I mean by that is up until now we've been dealing with things like moment capacity and shear capacity. You know, we're trying to find that load such that if we go over that, that force or if we load that beam anymore, we're going to fail the beam. The beam's going to crack. The beam is going to, to quit being able to resist load and we fail safety considerations. We're not talking about that type of consideration when we look at deflections. Deflections are more of a service limit state, and by that, we're talking about day-to-day -day use of the structure, you know, functionality, uh, durability, uh, and things like that. Because we are not considering safety in, in when we assess deflections, we do not use load combinations. We do not use 1.2 times the dead and 1.6 times the live because we adjust the magnitude of those loads for safety reasons, okay? We bump those load uh, values up to ensure that the beam does not fail. We're not talking about that here. Right now, all we're talking about is just the beam deflecting too much. Just because a beam deflects too much doesn't mean it's going to fail. It's a different type of check. So it's just something to keep in mind. That's number one. Number two, I'm going to bring back something that we did a while ago when we looked at transformed sections. Remember how we were applying load and then the beam cracked, so we had the upper portion of the beam that was concrete and we had that effective lump of steel at the bottom where we took the steel and we transformed it into a lump of concrete by multiplying by the modular ratio. That's coming back, okay? So it's just something I wanted you to be made aware of uh, what, you know, when we get into this. Okay, so like I said, there's really two types of limit state, generally, two types of limit states that we assess in structural engineering. Those that are primarily concerned with strength and the safety of our intended structure, and that's what we've been dealing with before, you know, the whole fee MN as opposed to MN, and 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live instead of just adding them up, that's a strength limit state. Service limit state is meant to just ensure day-to-day -day use. Make sure you're not cracking too much, you know, that you're not deflecting too much, that it's not vibrating too much, uh, and what have you. <coughs> In those instances, we don't apply load factors, okay? Now, um, one of the things that, that we find in concrete design and in just structural engineering in general, and this becomes sort of a, 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 a catch-22, it becomes sort of a, a problem that you can't quite fix in the world of structural engineering is that we're getting better here over the past you know, few decades and, and recent years in developing stronger, lighter materials where you know, we've got higher strength steels. You know, um, used to be back in the day that grade 36 steel was really strong. Now it's not that uncommon in some applications to see 100 KSI high strength steel. You look at pre-stressing strands, their you know, ultimate stress goes up to 300 KSI and something like that. I mean, we're seeing a lot of higher strength materials being used, so we get to use these, uh, these more slender, sleek elements. Less material sounds great. Problem is, is that there's a trade-off. 
You know, any time that you start reducing the section modulus and the moment of inertia of a section because you're allowed to use these higher strength materials, what's going to happen is it's going to deflect more, okay? And there's, there's a balancing act with that. Um, just because the structure is strong enough to stand up, you know, stand up safely does not mean, mean it's meeting its intended purposes. I mean, how would you all feel if this floor was perfectly safe to stand on but it was going like this, you know? That wouldn't be meeting the intended use of the structure, would it? Wouldn't be very comfortable to be in. Wouldn't be a very uh, appropriate classroom setting and what have you. That's a, that's a trade-off. I mean, I remember when I was a grad student, and um, uh, I'll never forget this because I thought it was hilarious. There was this professor doing research on a material known as fiber reinforced polymers. It's called FRP. And he was looking at just sort of like from square one trying to define uh, design specifications for members using FRP. And he ran into a little bit of a problem when he looked at deflections because he had this beam, and I mean the beam was about yay tall, and I'd say its length was, I'd say from about here to, I don't know, about, about here. And he had it set up on these two supports, and he had a load applied in the middle, and it was, I'll make up a number like, like five to 10,000 pounds or what have you, and literally the beam was going like this. Now, the stress was fine, you know. It was, it, the beam wasn't failing anytime soon, but the deflection was just crazy. There's no way that you could take that material and use it in a bridge system or a building system as a main load carrying uh, member because it's just not that stiff. It's strong, but it's not stiff. That's why you see FRP used for a lot of strength retrofits, like um, one, one uh, very uh, popular application of it is to retrofit reinforced concrete beams, like especially for seismic provisions. If you have a member that's, um, that isn't strong enough, you can sort of you know, use this epoxy and wrap it in FRP. It's almost like, imagine if you took fiberglass and heated it up past that glass transition point. FRP is kind of this flimsy film material. That's kind of what it looks like but it's got that strength associated with it. So, a little bit off of a tangent, but it's just a point I wanted to make that there's a difference between strength and stiffness, okay? <coughs> now, let's just talk about deflections in general. We, you know, hammered deflections into the ground last semester, okay? I taught you all structural analysis, and we use things like virtual work, we use direct integration, we use the conjugate beam method, we did this stuff last semester to compute deflections in beams. This is not structural analysis. This is a structural design course. So I expect that you all know how to use this stuff or know how to do this stuff, but I'm not expecting you to re, you know, create the wheel. You all remember those uh, design aids I gave you? The, the, it actually came from the American Wood Society and it had you know, moments and shears and what have you. It also has deflection. So if we're looking at, uh, let's say, a simply supported beam with a point load at mid-span, its maximum deflection is PL cubed over 48 EI, okay? It's there, okay? I've given you deflection formulas for fundamental, simple cases. So use them, okay? All right? Make sense? One other point I will say Make sure that you're being conscious of your units going into these expressions. PL cubed over 48 EI, E, KSI, I, inches to the fourth, P's and kips, L. Do you use feet? Inch it, see where I'm getting at? So make sure that you're using consistent units. Okay? Everybody good? Now, if you go back to just fundamental mechanics, you find that deflections are a function of the moment of inertia, okay? But it ain't that simple, okay? You can't just flat out say, well, I'll just use BH cubed over 12 and that's it. Because, of course, things have to be more complicated. Now, what I mean by that is let's take it this beam. This is just simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load, okay? So here's the beam, uniformly distributed load. What tends to happen is, remember that cracking moment? Remember that moment where the uh, stress exceeds the modulus of rupture, that 7.5 squared FC prime? It's been a while, but I know it was, like I said, we're bringing it back. 
what you're going to find is that there are regions of the moment diagram that exceed the cracking moment. So if I look at the beam under its typical service loads, part of that beam is, should be considered as cracked and part of it shouldn't. Okay? So the question is, do I use the cracked moment of inertia or do I use the BH cubed over 12, you know, if it's a rectangular beam? Which one do I use? And the answer is, I don't use either one. I use a little bit of my gross moment of inertia and a little bit of my cracked moment of inertia. And that's where this comes into play. So what this formula calculates is what's called an effective moment of inertia. It's taking into account the fact that some of the beam is cracked and some of it isn't. Okay? So if you look at it, we basically have, you know, a certain portion of the, uh, of the moments times the gross moment, er moment of inertia plus the remaining portion times the crack moment of inertia. So you can almost think of it as like, you know, 40% gross, 60% crack, or somewhere in between. It's, a, it's not directly linear because it's a function of this cubic expression, but for the most part, that's basically what we're looking at. <coughs> so this is a function of the gross moment of inertia, the cracked or the transformed moment of inertia, the cracking moment, remember that 7 point, the, the FRIG over YT, you know, the 7.5 squared FC prime, and then a function of your applied moment. And what I, what I say this applied moment, this M sub A, you just add up your moments directly. You are not taking into account your load factors. This is not a check of the beam's safety. This is a check of the beam's serviceability. It's day-to-day -day performance. That's, we're not checking safety here. That's what phi mn greater than or equal to mu is for. That's what phi vn greater than or equal to vu is for. It's not what this is for. <coughs> All right. Everybody good? Now, this is also a, a little, maybe a little more subtle, but um, you've got to sort of think about um, this in terms of load progression. If you ever take me for a course in bridge engineering, we spend a lot of time, and I mean a lot of time, talking about staged construction and about how loads progress on a bridge from start to finish. To give you kind of an example, and I, I like to sort of define this in terms of bridge engineering because I am a bridge engineer. That's what I sort of refer a lot of my examples back to. If I look at the construction of a typical bridge, let's say it doesn't matter if we're talking about a steel bridge or a concrete bridge. So We've got our river that we want to cross or creek or whatever. And the first thing we do, we go out, we uh, you know, start doing our earthwork. We maybe drive some piles or, or what have you, cast our abutments, get our abutment seats ready, and then it's time to erect the bridge. Let's talk about the superstructure. So first thing that we do is we set the beams onto the supports, right? So now you've got these beams by themselves sitting on the supports. What load are the beams being subjected to at this point? Self-weight. So the beams are being subjected to their own self-weight. I, I don't have any Easter candy around. I, I, would, I would pass it back. So <coughs> the beams are being subjected to their own self-weight, and the beams by themselves must be strong enough to resist that load, right? Then what do I do? Well, I put in maybe the cross frames or the diaphragms. I start erecting my formwork, start placing my rebar uh, and all of that, and then it's time to place the concrete deck. And again, we've got all these separate loads and, all, and the section that has to resist those is the beam by itself, right? Make sense? Now what happens? 28 days go by or probably less than that. The concrete deck cures, right? Now you all have seen, it doesn't matter if, if it's steel bridges or concrete bridges, for steel bridges, you all have seen shear studs before, they look like little nails sticking out of the top flange, you all seen those before, right? Well, if you work on a bridge project, you will, okay? It, for concrete beams, you tend to see these little rebar loops sticking out of the top of the beam. Over time, right, that concrete deck is going to cure and it's going to become composite with the beams. My point is, is now what you do is now the, the bridge is open for service and now the trucks are driving across the bridge. It's not just the beam by itself resisting those live loads. It's the beam plus some portion of the deck. 
Does that make sense? The point that I'm trying to make is that you have to be very careful in you know, making sure that you're taking into account when loads are applied at what point and what sections are responsible for resisting those loads. Now, that's sort of a, a very complicated example. This, what I'm talking about here, is a little more simple, but it goes kind of along the same path. All right, so let's take a, a concrete beam in a building. So what happens is I take the beam, I set it on its supports, right? So here's the beam. It's being subjected to its own self-weight, right? I apply loads, its own self-weight. The beam cracks a little bit, right? So under that dead load, it might have its own effective moment of inertia and its own deflections, OK? Then I apply the occupancy load, the, the office computers, the people, the, the furniture, all of that stuff, all, uh, the files, file storage, all of that stuff I apply, the live load. So now the beam cracks a little more. See, the building never, or the beam never truly experiences only a live load. It experiences its dead load, and then its dead load plus its live load. Does that make sense? If I want to, yes? You, you're actually, that's, that's a very good question. And, and there are instances where under construction, there have been bridges that have failed. During, during construction because all they were subjected to was their dead load. There was this, um, here's a for instance, um, if you ever look up the Marcy pedestrian bridge collapse, what they did is they had the beam, they set it down, they started applying the uh, wet concrete and pew, whole beam turned over. That happens, so. <coughs> I mean, really, I mean, th there are instances where um, uh, and this happens quite a bit in, in bridge engineering, particularly if you're dealing with like a really complicated bridge, like a, a steel bridge that's got like a lot of curvature and skew. What you find is that during construction, it experiences its largest stresses. It's actually governed by the dead load stresses it experiences during construction. In other words, it's one of those bridges where once you actually get the deck cast, and you get it composite, that bridge isn't going anywhere. It's actually getting it constructed that's the difficult part. And, in, and we're talking about instances where the structure is being subjected to its own dead weight, and that's it. So that happens. I mean, uh, it's one of those things that's easy to ignore. So They actually re rewrote the bridge specification not too long ago, and one of the provisions that's now in the bridge code says that it is the engineer's responsibility to ensure that the bridge can be constructed, that it can survive all of the loads that it's going to experience during the construction phase. That used to not be spelled out in the spec. I know it seems to make sense that you need to check that, but a lot of time, you know, you know, back in the day, really wasn't clear whose responsibility that was. Is it the engineer's responsibility? Is it the contractor's responsibility? Is it the fabricator's responsibility? That wasn't that clear back in the day. It, it is now. So I go on about that all day. But did that answer your question? But Marcy Pedestrian, look, look that up. So. <coughs> so, but going back, going sort of continuing on with your point and with what I was discussing earlier, there is never an instance where the beam experiences solely the live load. It, it experiences its dead load and then the dead load plus the live load. Now you as an engineer can compute, well, what was the net deflection that came from just the live load? For instance, if I calculate dead load deflection and it's a quarter of an inch, and then I calculate the total deflection and it's three quarters of an inch, then I know that the live load caused half an inch of deflection. Does that make sense? That's how you've got to approach de uh, deflections with concrete because more load equals more cracking, which equals different section. So it's not as simple as, as, uh, as, as just that straightforward approach. <coughs> All right. So does anybody have any questions? All right, so what I want to do is I want to look at this example. I want to compute what I'm going to call the instantaneous live load deflection. Now, 
I'll explain what that means really briefly so that you understand. But concrete is one of those materials that's behavior changes over time. For instance, if I cast a, two identical concrete beams right next to each other, and I test one of those beams as soon as the concrete cures, and I test another one of those beams 30 years later, I'm going to get different responses, even if they're exactly identical. Concrete is a funny material that way. It, it's subjected to creep. It's subjected to things like shrinkage, moisture effect, that, that stuff. It happens. So what we do in the world of uh, uh, deflection calcs to, to sort of address that is we have a, a, a delineation between what we call instantaneous live load deflection and total dead load deflection or, or sustained dead load or live load deflection over time. So here's my beam. I left this off of the slide last time. See, I might want to write this. We're going to treat this beam as simply supported. But the beam's 20 foot long. It has a dead load of one kip per foot. We're going to say that includes the self weight of the beam. It has a live load of 700 pounds per foot. It's three KSI normal weight concrete. Um, and we got three number nine bars. Here's the dimensions. And I want to compute the instantaneous live load deflection. So what I've got to do is I've got to compute the dead load deflection. I've got to compute the dead plus the live. And then I've got to take the difference of the two. I can't just compute the live. I'll get the wrong answer. All right. Does that make sense? OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Be that way. Okay. So this is going to bring back probably uh, a lot of things. That, you know, it's been a while since we've looked at. So let's um, let's start off with some of our beam parameters, just to sort of line this out. All right, so we have a beam that's how long? Two hundred forty inches, right? We'll say it's a dead load of one kip per foot, and this includes self weight. and a live load of 0 0.7 kip per foot. All right. <coughs> we have an FC prime, 3 KSI, what's D? D is what, 17 inches? And H is 20 inches. And now help me out, what's the area of steel? Three, because number nine is one square inch. Okay. Okay. Now, let's sort of, let's go back to a couple things. Uh, all right, here's our formula for the effective moment of inertia. Now, to compute the effective moment of inertia, we're going to need a number of things. We're going to need applied moments, which I'm going to handle that later because we're going to have to take dead loads and live loads. We're going to have to take that carefully. We're going to need a cracking moment, a gross moment of inertia, and then a cracked moment of inertia. Let's start off. Let's you know, we'll do the easiest one first and then move on from there. All right. So let's deal with the gross moment of inertia. Okay, how do I calculate the gross moment of inertia for this section? It's a rectangle. There we go. BH cubed over 12. So the 12's cancel. 20 cubed. 20 times 20 is 400. Times another 20 gives us 8,000. Simple one, right? 
Now, what if this was a T-beam or an I-shaped beam? We'd have to, you know, do the table, the parallel axis theorem, the A, the Y, the AY, the isomnot, D. You all remember that? We're going to bring that back here in a little bit. Okay. Now, here's the gross moment of inertia. Let's look at the cracking moment. All right, so we've got our gross moment of inertia. Let's see if y'all remember. How do we calculate yt? Y'all remember that? From the center of the beam to the extreme fiber and tension, or the centroid of the beam to the extreme fiber and tension. What is that? It's a rectangle, h over 2. All right, that's y sub t. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we got to calculate the modulus of rupture. Remember that was 7.5 lambda square root of Fc prime. I don't know if I said in this problem that it was normal weight concrete, but we'll assume it is. So, did I? Oh, okay. All right. So, 7.5 times 1 times the square root of what? 3,000. There you go. You put in PSI, you get out PSI. And that is 410.8 PSI. So therefore, the cracking moment is FR IG over YT, which is 410 point, whoop, goodness, I have myself. And then 8,000. YT is 10 inches. Now, that's going to come out, we're doing a moment, we're calculating a moment, so that's going to come out in inch pounds to sort of regularize that a little bit. Let's convert those inches into feet. And let's convert those pounds into kits. All right. Oop. So, uh, plug and chug, and you're going to get uh, 27. Point thirty nine foot kips. All right. I know it's been a while since we've done that calc, but it sort of reared its ugly head again. Is that all right? Does anybody have any questions? All right. Uh, I'll give you all a moment to. Give you all a moment. You know, I asked the uh, I asked Professor Huffman if the geotech teams had settled on a on an alternative design. <laughs> it's Monday, but I don't get the jokes are still going to happen. So, has everybody got everything they need on here? Can I move on? All right, all right. Uh, do, 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 do. Example fourteen a. Okay. All right, so now we need to do the cracked moment of inertia or the transformed. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're saying, you know, We've got these applied loads, and what we're trying to do is figure out how much of the beam is cracked and how much of it isn't. So we've got our gross moment of inertia. That was the easy one. 
Now we've got to do our cracked moment of inertia. And remember when you do a cracked moment of inertia, you say, all right, all the concrete in compression, that's still intact. But all the concrete that's in tension, that's gone. And all we've got is that, remember that lump of steel at the bottom? Y'all remember that? So we've got a section that looks something about like this. Let's see. Here's our section. And that's where it cracked. That's the neutral axis. And then we've got this lump of steel down here, right? Okay, this dimension here, what is that? 12 inches. And then I don't know what this dimension right here is. I'm going to call that X. Okay? This dimension, see if y'all remember, what am I going to call that? D minus X, or in this case, we'll just write it out and say it's what, 17 minus X? Good enough for government work, right? And then here we've got NAS equals something. Now, let's see if you all, you know, we're chugging those memory banks, charging those memory banks, see what we can figure out. Okay, we have to calculate N. Remember, N's our modular ratio. It's the ratio of the modulus of elasticity of the concrete, the modulus of elasticity of the steel, or steel on top, concrete on the bottom. So, what's the modulus of elasticity of steel? There we go, 29,000 KSI. Now, does anybody remember how to calculate the modulus of elasticity of concrete? It's been a while, hasn't it? Oh, oh no. Remember, normal weight concrete, there's a trick. Fifty-seven thousand times square root of FC prime, right? So Put in PSI, get out PSI. So that comes out to be 3,122 uh, PSI or about 3,122.02 KSI. So our modular ratio is ES over EC. All right, so am I going too fast or are y'all good? So divide those two out and you're going to get a numerical value of about 9.29. Y'all remember what we do with that? Yeah, so yeah, we just say therefore take n to be 9. So if n equals 9, what's this? 27. Not too bad, right? Pretty straightforward. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if we sum moments about the neutral axis, so remember what I'm doing is I'm saying an area times a moment arm, right? So, if I look above the uh, neutral axis, what's the area of this rectangle? 12x. What's the moment arm? How far is it from the neutral axis to the centroid of this rectangle? x over 2. So, that's 12x.
times x over 2. And that's got to equal the moment contribution from the lower end. So what's my area below? It's just this, right? 27 times what moment arm? 17 minus x. So, multiply this out a little bit. So if I've got 12x times 1 half x, that's what? 6x squared. And then on the right, we have 27 times 17. That comes out to be 459. Then minus 27x. So that gives us 6x squared plus 27x minus 459. You all can do that, right? I, I would hope. It's like 7th or 8th grade or something like that. Okay, plug and chug, and that will give you I'll give you that, right? So what does that mean? All right, I'll give you all a minute. I see some folks still writing, so I'll give you a minute. All right, everybody good? Okay. Oh, there it is. So that's fine and dandy, but we still haven't computed a moment of inertia. All we've done is compute where the centroid is for our transform section. Now we've already got the centroid, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up as follows. Well, here, I'll, I don't need that. I'll just do this. I'll say. like an Autobot or Decepticon logo right here. In response to your Transformers reference. What's that? That was a good one. That was a good one. All right. Okay. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll compute the moment of inertia of each shape, the area of each shape, and then the distance uh, from the neutral axis. So for the concrete, moment of inertia, we need the moment of inertia of that rectangle, which is going to be bx cubed over 12, right? Right? We're looking at the moment of inertia of that upper rectangle, so just bx cubed over 12. Uh, plug and chug, and you should get about 311.83. Now, the, for the steel, it's just a lumped value at a given point, so it doesn't have a moment of inertia, so we take that to be zero. Now the area, all right, for the concrete, the area is just going to be B times X, which is 81.37. And then 
the area of the steel is what? Well, three times our mo 27. There you go. All right. All right. <clears throat> For our uh, D distance, it's from the centroid of the whole thing to the centroid of each individual shape. So how do we get from the neutral axis to the centroid of the rectangle? X over 2. So plug and chug, and that's like 3.39. And how do we get from the centroid of the whole thing to the where the steel is? 17 minus x, or d minus x, which is 10.22. All right. So now we can compute parallel axis theorem. So. What do I do? Just row by row. I take this value plus that times that squared, and then this value, which is zero, plus that times that squared. Plug and chug, and I'll get the following. So sum that up. And I get that the cracked moment of inertia is 4066.7 inches to the fourth. Funny enough, if you actually go back to the first example that we did on this, this is actually the exact same beam. I should just sort of rehash it. It's the exact same one we did before. So <coughs> it was like example two or something. It's the same beam. All right. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so we still got a little bit of time. I want to at least do the dead load. Okay? So, so what we're going to do now is compute the dead load deflection. So, so let's sort of make sure we have our eyes on the prize. So the goal in this problem is to compute the deflection due to the live load. We can't really do that, but what we can do is compute the dead load deflection, the dead plus the live, and then it's the difference. Okay, so now we're going to do the dead load deflection. Now I want to summarize some of these values so that you know what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So help me out with a couple things. What was the gross moment of inertia? What is the cracked moment of inertia? Well, it's right there. 4066, right? Do these two values make sense just looking at them? The fact that this value is smaller, does that make sense? Of course it does. If I crack the beam, it's going to be weaker. So it should make sense. All right. Now, the cracking moment, what was that? It was like uh, 27 .39 foot kips. Now, our applied load, no load factors. It's just W L squared over 8. Okay? Just W L squared over 8. So one kip per foot. Well, how long does this mean? Again, doesn't matter what units you use as long as you're labeling and that you're consistent. So that's 50 foot kips. Oh, what am I doing now? 
All right, help me out. Looking at these two numbers, is some of this beam going to be cracked? Yeah, because remember our moment diagram is parabolic. It's going to go something about like that. All right. Our cracking moment is about 27 foot kips, but the peak, that maximum moment, is 50. So some of it's going to be cracked, some of it isn't. Okay? So my effective moment of inertia is not going to be that or that. It's going to be somewhere in between. Make sense? So does everybody have everything up here? Because, okay, all right. All right, so here's, oh, goodness. So here's the beam. All right. And here's the distributed load. Right? Okay. So the moment diagram looks, uh, well, something about like that, right? Okay. This value is 50. Okay. Now the cracking moment is 27.39. So that's, I don't know, about right there, maybe about right there. So if I look at what theoretically this beam should look like, like let's say here's the beam, what I'm saying is that from here to here I should have a bunch of cracks because those are the regions where the moment has exceeded the cracking moment. So if I look at the moment of inertia of this beam, it's not a totally uncracked beam, but it's not a totally cracked beam either. It's somewhere in between. Does, does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody else? Okay. That's a good question. That's a good question. All right. Uh, I tell you what. We just ran out of time, so we'll say to be continued on this one, and we'll hit it up next time. Sound good? All right. We'll see you.